And thank you all the ladies of the Women's Guild for helping us put this on today. We are here today to talk about Samson and Delilah. And to begin with, I'd like to each one of the cast here to come down and introduce themselves to you. Starting with Robert. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think many of you know my capacity as director of the company and I'm principal conductor. And in this case, I'm also staging the production. So, uh, so that's my role. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Richard Cox. I'll be singing Samson in the production. My name is Joel Coleman, and I'll be playing the old Hebrew. <laughs> now, we're waiting for Greg Grimsley, and we're expecting him so he will be in that seat when, if and when he shows it's up. It's hard to say. All the, Philist uh, all the Philistines have failed to show up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Hebrews are here. <laughs> we're representing. We're a majority. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, I want to start because everybody, I think, yeah, knows yeah. this story from the Bible of Samson and Delilah. This story is a little bit different than that which is in the Bible, so I want to start and just have each of the characters, Robert's going to be representing a few characters, namely Delilah, um, <laughs> and kind of walk us through the plot of the, of, of the opera where your character comes in. Well, then, uh, also it's a little too easy because maybe it's built into the nature of, of being a conductor and director to dominate the conversation. So let me invite Samson, if he could, to begin first, because he appears well before Delilah does, uh -huh. as does the old Hebrew that Job is playing. Uh, so why don't, Richard, why don't you introduce the subject of your character? Of course. Of course. With God's permission, exactly. right? <laughs> of course. Um, you know, the, the great thing about Samson, um, I, we all know, we all have some knowledge of Samson, and uh, what uh, Sasson has done brilliantly is that we see the hero who this man is in the beginning, um, that he is uh, with the Israelites and, and, and in, in bondage with them. Uh, but And then in that first scene, it's just wonderful. And I, you guys are in for a treat when you hear this chorus sing, my goodness. Um, and it, you see, you have all of this huge scene with the Israelites in chains, and, and all of a sudden he says, enough. Enough. This is the day God has spoken to me and has said, this is the day that we are, we are no longer going to be in bondage. We're no longer going to be in chains. And it's a big... Um, revival of, of sorts um, to uh, inspire them and uh, it moves the action forward certainly within the story and uh, I think Joel can speak a little bit about who he is in this in relation to this and we can kind of go back and forth there with the uh, old Hebrew and who he is especially to me uh, in, that, in that first scene what we see so. I find that uh I connect to this role in, in, in very in many different ways because I serve as cantor at Temple Sinai on St. Charles Avenue. Oh. And uh, so when I see this role, because the cantor in the Jewish faith is also a role of clergy, uh, that uh, the old Hebrew, which sometimes uh, the maestro will call the rabbi, and I certainly don't mind being called a rabbi uh, either, but um, I'm like uh, Samson, he, he trusts me. He likes me. I think we've always had a long relationship together. I've been his advisor. And is the old Hebrew, I don't mince words with him. I'm telling him, I'm telling to him what, it, what, it, what Delilah is like and what his role should be as Samson, as a representative of God. God has chosen Samson. And I'm constantly, t I'm like this, I feel like Delilah is like, you know the, 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 the story where you have a guy sitting here and you have the angel in one ear and the devil in the other? Well, to me, that's, I'm, I'm like the angel part. And in a way, Robert, I, I see him staging it in that way, where uh, Delilah is over there and I'm on stage left, and sometimes I'm coming closer, and as Delilah comes closer, in a way, Robert is staging me to go back a little bit, and quite frankly, I don't win. Uh, Delilah wins, and, uh, which really that's how the first act closes, but I start off with a uh, participating really in singing in a hymn of praise, which to me is what a cantorial role is, because in a cantorial role what you are is uh, 
is a what we call a shaliach tzibor, a messenger of the prayer. And that's what the chorus, the old Hebrew chorus is, and that's what the old Hebrew is. He, they're really, and Samson is there too, singing along. We're, what we're, we're a messenger of prayer from God. And uh, then slowly uh, I segue into this um, doom of what happens if he again goes, comes close to Delilah again. So if you want to pick it up from there. Well, let, let me interject uh, s something. Oh, yeah, oh, Richard. Uh, yeah, don't worry. No, please. You're, you're the principal character here, uh -huh. and so I'd love to hear your response to I, Joel's I, comments. I, I, actually, exactly what Joel said. And the fascinating thing I think about about this relationship here is that um, it's not a father-son situation, but it, it he's an advisor, and I think it's very clear with what Maestro has done with the staging as well that he is very well respected um, as well and and he is looked to for uh, advice and counsel through everyone there and we see that in the staging that I, I really like that about this production is it, it, it really stresses the importance of who this man is not only to me but to all of them so and I think that's a, that's a really wonderful thing at the beginning well you know he's, he's called the old Hebrew and so the minute that you read something like that within a drama, then you think, okay, this character fulfills the function of a village elder. Mm -hmm. You could move that into almost any culture and say that the elders of the village were the, the, the patriarchal figures. They were the source of wisdom. And this is just as true in every culture today. Mm -hmm or at least it should be. Young people should be willing to learn from their elders. And so uh, when you're dealing with a religious subject, uh, as, as Joel says, I, I often refer to the old Hebrew as kind of the rabbi, but I, I realize he is not. But, but the interesting thing, to, to follow up on an observation you just made, as the messenger of prayer, it's a question I ask the chorus, what about this day is different? After all, Samson has been in bondage with these people, and in spite of his great strength and his heroism on the battlefield, some of which we're about to, to hear about at least, he is too trapped in the same drudgery of being captive, and yet he suddenly says, God speaks to me today, and the, what you hear is the voice of God. Why should they believe that? Well, I try to strengthen that association a little bit by having the old Hebrew and Samson enter together halfway through the first chorus. It's such desolation. They sing, God has stopped listening to us, to our prayers. We are sorry that we have, not, have strayed from the true path. We, we are seeking uh, the reassurance that God still listens to us. And Samson enters with the old Hebrew. And of course, as all of us do in times of crisis, we turn to ministerial figures for solace and for guidance. So needless to say, the Hebrew people turn to the village elder, if you will, to to seeking answers has God simply stopped listening to us and Samson says stop all of this the new message a, the vo a voice a new voice has arisen within me and then he goes on to explain that yes the God of our fathers still is blessed will be willing to bless his children but we must break our chains we must throw off the shackles of slavery, and we must march in the name of God. And what is their response? They say, alas, these are empty words. The days when God listened to us and protected his children are gone. And he says, just a minute, that's blasphemy. You must believe in the divine mission that our role, my role as this new ambassador of God. And so, you know, for, for those raised in the Christian faith, they, they, these are very comfortable words. These are very, very familiar images. And then to rouse the chorus, 
he really starts drawing on Old Testament references, and I guess this is just as true. Uh, you, you, you teach within the Jewish theology, but I'm assuming that the, that the images of the, the armies of, of angels marching together to, to seek retribution and all of the vivid imagery that's suggested in this text when Samson says, when I look to heaven, what I see are armies of angels gathering to avenge God, and they have in their hands flaming swords and driving before them the angels of darkness that cry out in fear. Well, what we see is a spirit of transformation in the, in the Jewish na nation, the Hebrew nation there, that comes to life, and finally they actually do believe. And they say, yes, the Spirit of God is speaking through this man, and we will march with him into battle. And so where, where we start emotionally at the beginning is desolation and despair. Samson enters and preaches that, no, we will be led by the God of the past that favored his nation. And then finally we're actually ready to throw off our chains and march into battle. So with that as a background, perhaps you two can, can join in and see if there's something you would like to enhance from that. I think the old Hebrew has some high expectations for Samson. Right. He really does. And, and that's what I feel that I'm doing. I'm not singing during that part where uh, Samson is interacting with the, the Hebrews. I mean, I'm there, but he's, but I'm there sort of saying, yes, good, you're finally realizing your role. Yeah. Sorry. That's what yeah. I'm seeing. Is that, I'm proud of you now. Uh -huh. I believe the term is, not, is it Nazir? Yes. That's Would you explain that to us in theological <coughs> terms? In, what, in elaborating what you're asking. Well, because <laughs> Samson is one chosen by God. Right. And when, you, when I've read the book of Judges and the concordances about the book of Jud Judges from which this story comes in the Bible. There is much scholarly information about what a Nazir was. In other words, it's a, and I, I don't want to create a blasphemy by references to Greek mythology, but uh, but Samson is very much like Achilles. You know, Achilles was dipped in the river by Zeus and protected, except for a small part of his back, and that was, is what allowed him to be such a great warrior. And Samson, too, was chosen by God and protected by him. And the relationship of hair, long hair, that occurs in these characters is also common to a number of other cultures as a, as a divine sign. So when we work through the story and we can talk more about Delilah and her wiles and how Samson ends up with a haircut that he really doesn't want, <laughs> um, you begin to appreciate the significance of that as a, as a symbolic gesture. Is all. You know, here's something that I found interesting is that, you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and the tribe that Samson is from is the, tri uh, is the tribe Dan. Uh, Dalud Nun Sofit, that's the Hebrew spelling. So, and I, and, and, and I, and it's funny because I have this connection to all those tribes because when I wear a talus, a ceremonial, uh, uh, you want to say, kind of robe, every Friday and Saturday morning, my talus has images of all the tribes of Israel. Uh -huh. And there I have the tribe of Dan right here, and here I get to see it. <laughs> being presented in, it's just so dramatic to me. And uh, the other thing that um, I know is that this, Samson was selected, I think, even before he was born. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is, it, it is such a special legend, or we, we're not sure, but we know that there was some, there was some type of strong man. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go with what we, with this story, because it's so wonderful. Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know if Samson has been meeting up to his role because he's been, you know, it's still a problem today, you know. You can't help it. My son is, lives in Israel. He's 25 years old, and he tells me he's dating a girl from Korea. 
And, and I'm thinking, you couldn't find a Jewish girl in all of this. So I'm going through the same thing here. You know, Samson, he's got all these Jewish women around him, and who is he hanging with? Philistine women. Richard, pick it up. Well, I think that that's what's so interesting, I think, uh, about Samson, is that we see this wonderful scene at the beginning where he's inspiring all of his people to, to really change their entire fate and, in one way, stepping into what he has been preordained to do in his life. And then at the very end of that scene, all it takes is one little entrance from uh, Delilah. And uh, that all of a sudden it creates from this wonderful heroic stance to this sort of wonderful, and there is a trio, that, but there's, it's a magnetic pull with those two, you know, angel and devil on the shoulders. And it, 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 it's just, it, it's immediate, but it's so strong with him, the bond with Delilah, of what they had, um, that he forsakes all of it. And when we see that later on, so. Um, if if Greer is able to join us, then certainly. Uh, so far, so I would say just move I, I <laughs> Certainly. Well, I didn't want to walk all over his material because the great duet in the second act between Delilah and the high priest of Dagon explains much of what Richard just referenced, and that is we find out much more of the past of Samson with Delilah. Now, those of, those of us that read the Bible know the, the, the nuances of the story, that they had a long relationship, and on at least three other occasions, she attempted to wrest from him the secret of his great strength. Mm. And on all three of those occasions, right at the height of her seductive powers, he would say, oh, well, you have to bind me in fresh rope, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. And so each time, the minute he would doze off, then she would bind him in ropes, or she would do these various things. And he would awaken to throw that off. I'm surprised that, as smart as the man is, he didn't become suspicious. <laughs> but love is a funny thing, as you know. <laughs> so, yeah. but oh, I'm picking up on the hints. No, I, I, yeah, a little slow. That's why I have the advisor here. <laughs> but, but to Richard's point, after we have the great rousing choruses of the Hebrews, the Isra Israelites because they're very concerned. They say they have lost everything. Their cities have been destroyed. The altars of Jehovah have been destroyed. We've even lost the name of our nation, Israel. So they are at an exceptionally low point. And he rouses them with his great challenge to march with him into battle. And they're confident we don't have weapons. We, we don't, you know, we're going to be easy prey for these armed Philistines. And he says, no, trust, you know, God will provide. And right at the height of their celebration of this newly found initiative to break their bonds, then the satrap of Gaza, remember, the first act takes place in the town square of Gaza, appears with his soldiers and says, it's right at dawn, and he says, who's making all this noise out here? Well, oh, it's that same rabble, the same Hebrew slaves, how dare you raise your voice in our cities, defy our rules, and think that you could be bold enough to throw off your chains. Now, a very important thing happens, and that is Samson steps in and says, actually, it is your mouth that defames God, and why don't you take it from there, Richard? Yes, you know, he's, he steps in and said, it's your, you're the, just what, what um, Maestro just said, that it's your mouth that defames God, it's you, it's you, that, and then he uses him as the example of what, what the entire, uh, all the Israelites are going to do now, and that is that we, we're... And there's, some, and there's some wonderful imagery as oh, he yes, fires yes. them up, in which he not only talks about the bands of angels with swords of fire, mm -hmm. but he, sa he actually s speaks to God, and he says, how can you listen to this and not mm -hmm. make the earth tremble? Mm -hmm. And then the chorus says to the guards and to Abimelech, 
yes, can you not feel the earth tremble in God's presence? Which to these Philistines is little more than childish prattle. They don't anymore believe in Jehovah or have any fear of that. They have their own gods, Dagon in this instance. So they say, you call on anyone you want. After all, you are the people in bondage. And it, the scene builds as, as Samson is able to use all the wonderful rhetorical images, if you will, of the Bible to rouse these people so that they actually are able, with his assistance in killing, when Abimelech draws his sword, then Samson disarms him and kills him right there in front of everyone, and everyone just knocks the guards down. They take their spears from them and kill a few of them and just maraud mm -hmm. over them. And then we all know from biblical accounts that Samson led the, led the Hebrew nation into the country. They burned the harvest, destroyed the fields of the Philistines, then regrouped and came back and overran the city of Gaza. Right. So, we have this great leadership here. And the reason I mention it is this, because we have in this instance Samson calling on God for a sign. And he at least gives figuratively this spirit of leadership. And when we get to the very end of the opera, we find ourselves in the same place, though now he's blind and weak and has been held in prison and so forth. Samson says, God, give me just one more miracle, one more chance. But we'll get to that in context. <laughs> so so the, um, the first scene ends with the triumph of the Israel nation overthrowing Abimelech and his soldiers and marching out into the countryside to, to wreak as much havoc as they can. Then the high priest enters and says, what's this I see? And he lays the framework for the drama that follows. And that is, he, he, he taunts these Philistine soldiers and says, actually, you're just like a bunch of women. You're just afraid of, the, of this man. Go, why aren't you chasing? He says, you know, just as fearful as women. Sorry. They, they weren't very politically correct, nine centuries B.C. Uh, the, uh, but he accuses these, these men of being uh, cowards. And then they have to remove the bodies of the dead guards and so forth. And then we have the return, this time, of the old Hebrew with the men of the village. And really, he is here truly fulfilling a religious function. That is, it's what I've asked for, a consecration ritual. And I, di I will uh, say it was fun to be able to have the resource of a cantor and a rabbi. I uh, went to Temple Sinai and took the valuable time of the rabbi and, and Joel to say, you know, we put lots of Catholic ritual on stage in opera because it is so Italian. You know, and so many scenes take place in the church, and we do te deums, and we do masses, and we do all these things. Give me some guidance about what, how you would have consecrated in the ninth century B.C., how you would have consecrated Samson for this military victory. And so I got some wonderful suggestions about what ritual might be, and what they might have carried into battle, and what they would have used. And so we've come back with something very simple, but I think will be very eloquent with a little bit of a military effect, because after all, this is the result of a military victory. So when they raise their swords for blessing and so forth, that would be what ties it together. Please. I found, I, I, Robert asked a very good question. And so not only did I talk about it with Rabbi Cohn, wonderful Rabbi Temple Sinai, I even called uh, the Rabbi uh, Balin at Hebrew Union College in New York, who teaches medieval Jewish history, and asked her, <laughs> and called some other people who are a lot smarter. Mm -hmm. And it's what I learned, and I knew this, but it sort of comes in the context, but literally 100 years later, the, there, the battle still is going on between the Philistines and the Israelites. But did you know that the Philistines actually captured the Ark of the Covenant? Oh. Because the Israelites would carry something like that into battle to inspire the soldiers. But 
After the Philistines captured this, they gave it back seven months later. They gave it back. They called them up. They said, you got to pick this up. This is giving us bad, <laughs> bad, bad karma. Yeah. I mean, they sent them a text message. you got to come right now. <laughs> so uh, it, it was interesting to watch previous productions of what they did Judaically. Uh, because they would not have used the, uh, a menorah because there was only one and it was north of Jerusalem in Shiloh. There was only one. There was no gift shops to pick anything up. <laughs> but I found it interesting that the Ark of the Covenant was inspired. So uh, we're not using the Ark of the Covenant, which actually is pr probably the most accurately it's, they could have, because who's going to argue over a hundred years? Well, I'll tell you, we are now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had talked about that. Right, but, about but with what's a hundred years in yeah. opera? So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I like that. So because there are other symbols that people would use. The, if you have the image of a Torah that is used in a Jewish service that's wrapped in, uh, how, in, uh, scrolls. in a scrolls, it, w it wasn't in that form at that time in history. You see, there was fragments of it, including the Ten Commandments, that was in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what, but what some opera productions have done, which I found so fascinating, is they literally went down to their local temple and said, could we borrow your Torah and use it on stage? And that's what they had them carry on stage. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, that would have been, that would, really would have been off. But Ark of the Covenant is actually, makes a lot more sense to me of what, Right. what the Jews would have carried. And that's what you will carry when you enter the very first time. Wow. With, with Samson. Wow. And that came from this conversation with, with it. Now, you will also see a lot of Hebrew text when the, in our production. What I've asked for is a scram mid-stage and projected on that is a lot of Hebrew text. And I asked someone if it said anything, and I think they said it read a little like a Walmart sales catalog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward. Uh, <laughs> might be the director of the gift shop. Well, I'm going to look forward to seeing that because yeah. uh, I was in the uh, summer lyric production of Fiddler on the Roof, and during this oh. dream sequence, they had some tombstones with some Hebrew, and uh, obviously the person who advised them knew some Hebrew but didn't advise. And so they didn't realize it, but they spelled out that they they spelled out Adonai Don. They spelled out that God died in oh. Hebrew, and they didn't realize it, so wow. they had to change it. Wow. So it it it'll be interesting to see the Hebrew. I'm sure it'll just be scrambled like yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's more for the calligraphy of the right. symbols the, and, the, and that look. But if you do read Hebrew, don't look for the book of Judges up there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it certainly looks authentic, and, and it will <coughs> certainly create the nice atmospheric touch that we want. But you can see, at least there's been some thought given to how do you present this subject on the stage without being inconsistent with what we know or perceive to be these rituals or the, this cultural statement. So, uh, it, it certainly hasn't been haphazard in the approach of just throw anything up there. Now, back to the characterization. We do have a little consecration ceremony. The men have come returned from the victory of their battle. Uh, the, the old Hebrew comes in and they, they bless the swords and then Samson comes and is blessed by the old Hebrew. And then the men leave. And then we get to the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other that Joel mentioned, and that is just as they, these two men are leaving the stage, they hear women's voices, and it's the women coming out of the temple of Dagon with Delilah. And so he pauses, he wishes that they hadn't paused, and then of course uh, Delilah sees Samson and says, I've come to celebrate the victory of the man that I love. And that's about all that it takes. And after that, we see the struggle between these three people. What's interesting is Delilah sings to Samson in the present tense and present time and says, by the way, why don't you come to the Valley of Sorek and visit me again as you used to. I've longed for that time when we, and the old Hebrew says, Let's go. <laughs> you know, this woman was sent to cross your path, and she is poison. 
please do not stay. And then Delilah sings, and of course he's singing all these asides. He's the only one that never really talks to anyone except himself mm -hmm. and to God. And he says, God, spare me from my weakness, mm -hmm. because you know that I have a problem with this woman. Yeah. I keep saying, Femme, Monsieur, close my eyes. Close my eyes. Don't let me see her. Because he's telling me not and to he listen. Says, he says, Ferme oreille. And, and I'm like, no, no, just ears. close my <laughs> eyes. Close my yeah. eyes. That's what I don't yeah. need to see. So that's right. a, it's a very interesting uh, mo a moment between us three. I think it's very, right. everything turns. And, 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 the, and Joel, uh, I don't want to steal your thunder, so tell them what you're singing at, in your admonitions to them. Well, what I'm saying is, is that if you go off to this woman, the wrath of God will, will punish you. And, and you know what Samson does? Just <laughs> totally ignores what I have to say. Exactly. And as the music plays to the end of the um, first act, well, later on, but that, that's a little bit later after some, but he just, he just doesn't get it for me. He, his, that part of him is just so enraptured in Delilah that even, even the threat of punishment of God itself can't break that that attraction, right? Well, the love, the love that's there for her, I, I, and we've we've talked about this a great deal. Right, and we we've arrived at the point which is the second act now. Um, so the the old Hebrew has a very good chance to convince Samson to just go with him. Let's return to the men. Let's leave. We've had our consecration ceremony. The women come out. That's one of the first of the ballet sequences, by the way. Uh, the New Orleans Ballet Theater will again be dancing for the company. Oh, so well, wonderful, the beautiful little yeah. ballet uh, dance of the Philistine priestesses. And then she uses, Delilah uses all the richness of the language of love and spring. Printemps c'est commence is that the spring is beginning, and as we all know, and in the spring, a young man's fancy turns to love. We still use cliches like that, <laughs> and Samson's certainly does. So she wins the battle between the the, the will of not. Now, she said, "Come see me in Sorek Valley at now." So curtain comes down on the first act, and then the second act begins with Delilah convinced. That I'm sorry, it is a good shock. Our Delilah is not able to be with us this afternoon, but I will play her role. And um, she first, first, let me. In, would you, would Ron? Would you, you two, stand up and introduce yourselves because they're actually in the production. I think most of you know me, <laughs> Cindy Mistro, Ron oh. Mistro. Now they, in supporting the company, purchased you know the role to play supers at Opera last year. And so Ron is being a guard and Cindy is going to be one of the ladies in waiting to Delilah. It was at the Opera Ball last year that I did on the silent And they have been very dutifully showing up for rehearsals and <laughs> being put on stage. And so we've come to the scene where Cindy will be a part of it, which is we see Delilah in her boudoir. That is, she is dressing. She's made a date with Samson, and she's confident that he's going to come, and so she has her ladies fixing her hair and putting her bracelets on, perfume, all of these things. And so there's just a busy little scene we see through a scrim. And then when she's ready to sing, then she dismisses her ladies, and she steps out onto her terrace, and she says, Amor vieme de, a ma faiblesse. Love, come aid me because she's convinced that he will show up. And she sings this wonderful aria, and then who shows up but the high priest instead. Now, of course, what's happened since she left the town square where she was able to seduce him and, and with the priestess's ballet in those moments is the, the Israelites have won the battle. They uh, ravaged the fields. They've returned, and they've taken over the city. The high priest says it was too easy a victory for them. Why? Because our people are so terrified of the great warrior Samson. And she says, don't worry about it. You might have military might, but I have a greater power. 
And then we have a wonderful little contradiction there where the high priest and Delilah, the high priest says, by the way, the word on the street <laughs> is that he's given up on this love for you. And he's talking to a woman who's, a, who's just engaged in a great seduction of him earlier in the day. She says, no, I'm convinced that he's coming. And he says, well, what about all those other times that you tried to convince him to tell his secret? And she says, well, I tried everything but the one that always works, and that's tears. Mm -hmm. So when we get to this great past of the two of them, where she talks about his tricking her, telling her what would be the source of his great power, that's what this grand duet is about. So the high priest comes. And he says to her, you must help us. We're desperate. You seem to be the only source that we could turn to, the only power. And she says, I will help you. And he says, and if you can succeed, you, it's almost like King Herod in Zalome, which says, if you do what I ask, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. He says, I, I'll, I'll give you any of my riches that you want. And she says, what do I want with money? I have a different thing that I have to achieve here, and that is what I need to do is satisfy my hate for this man. Now, that puts us in a very different place. Why? We've just seen a great seduction scene, and we're about to see an even greater one. And it's the only opera, Todd, you're an opera scholar, it's the only opera duet that I know in which there are all of these avowals of great love and one of the characters is not speaking a word of truth. <laughs> Everything that she says, she's already told us that the thing that's driving her is her hatred for this man. So, you know, it makes for an odd dynamic on the stage. I mean, it's fun to stage, but you just stage it as a great love to it, and you realize she needs to be a pretty good actress. But from the point of view of dramatic irony for you as audience, I mean, when you see a character say, now I'm going to engage in this farce, um, does it create a barrier for us? The complete lack of sincerity on her part, does it, is that part of our issue with Delilah, or is it just simply a simple moral judgment? We invite questions, by the way. <laughs> Let's, we have it's about ten to five, so oh. let's get to the end of the the, the oh. final scene. That's the, the duet with you, oh, and, yes. and when you come into the scene now. Okay, into this into this scene. Well, and just what <clears throat> he was just saying is the interesting thing about it is, um, I come running on and have cra traveled a great distance, which she talks about earlier, to get to Sark Valley, um, because I've traveled it before, obviously, and. Um, I basically say I can have convinced myself that I'm here, but I'm just here to tell her that we can't continue. That's 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 what I'm here for, and uh, of course that doesn't quite work. <laughs> so uh, the interesting thing is that he is very sincere. He is very sincere with her, and uh, the moment I feel personally uh, that that Samson tells her, Emma, I love you," it's that's when it's all over and it hits him I think like a ton of bricks because at that very moment I feel like that he has made his decision then without even he gave in it's it's all over now and actually she knows it too it's a wonderful it's a wonderful moment in in the opera and what what has been done with the staging I think is it's very special with the the fact that her tear her tears is are what finally push me over the edge. And I even, I even, even past that, when she starts questioning about, que questioning me about my strength, the source of my strength again, and my reaction to that is, well, wait a second, what does that matter? I just told you I love you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Nothing else matters, right? Nothing else matters. And she keeps pressing that, that that's the only way that she will know that it's not that I, I will be faithful and I won't leave her again. And I'm so upset that I go back to begging God for uh, asking him for strength of what, what's going on. And I'm, I'm just a mess. He, poor Samson is just 
totally uh, torn up in this situation. And Such it, conflict. It's, it's really a lot, of, a lot of conflict for him. And in the end, um, the interesting thing is, I think, is that the fact that uh, she says, fine, leave, get out, and, and leaves. And it, it kills me so much that I rush after her. And the very interesting thing for me about this, what they've done here, is that um, we don't actually hear him tell her what it was. We don't. It's never in the in the uh, libretto or the score, but uh, he does it off stage. But she does win. Uh, she does win. Well, actually, you'll get to see it <coughs> because I stage it in a way that makes it very clear. Um, one interesting thing, though, about all of Samson's decisions and indecision and his his volatility in this scene is there is an approaching storm which starts at the top of the scene with a little flicker of lightning and then there's a little peal of thunder and that grows throughout and eventually it becomes transformed in all of Samson's references. This is the voice of God. You see, and so in, in theatrical terms, it's very colorful. I think Samson has found just the right reference point, but that's built in there, and as the, as the tension mounts, Samson always comes to a point where he capitulates, and then, as Richard said, he probably made his decision very early on in the act, that he's really staying there, he's not going anywhere, but he, um, but he does eventually succumb, and when she says, then if you won't tell me the secret, then it's all over, and she marches in back into her boudoir, and he can't resist, and he follows her. And of course, we see the caressing, and we see the embracing, and then we see the haircut, and then she jumps up and says, come to me, and the Philistines come, and they arrest Samson, and of course now he is in his weak state. The next scene, to me, is one of the great ones in the opera from a musical point of view, and a psychological point. Samson at the grist mill. He's in the prison. He's been chained to the grist mill, and so like an animal, he's forced to just grind the grain. And the Hebrew chorus is outside, and they're they're seeing their recriminations. Now, are they actually there at that point? Probably not. Now this is just in his mind. He's reliving every second their accusations that you betrayed us and you did it for that woman, and how could you have betrayed your brothers, and we're now back in bondage because of you and your betrayal. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful scene musically and theatrically. Then we go to what is the most famous scene in the opera, which is the Bacchanal. And it opens in the Temple of Dagon, and it, of course, presents the very famous ballet sequence, which we do on symphony concerts, just as music, the famous um, um, Bacchanal from Samson and Delilah. Again, danced, fully danced. And then we have the series of sacrificial rituals that the high priest says, first we bless the wine, second we bless the blood of our victims that will be sacrificed on our altars for exculpation of their crimes, and then last, Dagon appears in smoke and fire, and they brought Samson in to make fun of him, simply to make fun of him. We all know the biblical story of the little boy. Is there anything you want to jump in and add to this? No, yeah, no, you do. Uh, but um, <laughs> but the, um, you know, he's been given a little boy to guide him. And then the high priest, I mean, it's open ridicule and abuse of Samson push him down, they kick him around, they knock him down, they pour wine on him, they throw, Delilah throws wine in his face. It's cruel. It needs to be cruel to heighten the great gulf between his sincerity and pleading with God to give him the strength to perform another miracle. It's his own, it's his humiliation. It's the humbling of, of what the choices that he made that, um, now he has nothing. I mean, really, has nothing. And now, now he's just being humiliated publicly in front of everyone and by the one woman who who did it all. 
and she's she's basically making fun of his blindness and and everything. And now this great lawyer is now responsible for to hold on to a child to for everything. And then it can, completely consistent with the biblical account, um, the high priest says, put Samson up here where we can all see him to to tease him even more. And Samson says to the little boy. Lead me to the center of the temple where those pillars of marble are. And of course, he's led up to the altar and in between. And at the height of their celebration, of course, he starts praying. He says, give me my strength. Let me perform one more miracle and crush these people in this place. So that, that gift is granted. And so we have a wonderful conclusion to the album. You know, a great theatrical moment to see the temple come crashing down on the Philistines. And so, <laughs> so it's a very literal interpretation of the Bible in Sasson's score. I, I think for myself personally, the crushing of the people was my favorite part. Um, <laughs> tell us, tell us, uh, it's interesting though, as the score also says, that the curtain falls very quickly. There's not a lot of people crushing the happen. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to do to make that happen. Well, th this is the blessings of the contemporary theatrical language because we have animation. And with projections and animation, you're able to do so much more than you can just with big styrofoam blocks that often bounce when they, when they fall. But uh, so we have some of that for, I think, I think a, a, pic a very picturesque closing to the album. But um, but it's it's uh, it's a grand a grand piece and of course it's I think the, all of the religious symbolism in it regardless of your faith regardless of your your culture it is a story of right and wrong and it's just very simply that taken and interpreted through your personal filter or the, that of any of any culture and so. It has a, a very interesting history because Saint-Saëns uh, Saint started the piece as an oratorio. He was very influenced by Handel's great oratorios and by Mendelssohn's great oratorios. And so he set about to give us a biblical interpretation of this story as an oratorio. And then Franz Liszt and the librettist uh, both suggested to him that this would be a great subject for an opera. And so he struggled with that. And so I think an accusation has been made that the piece is somewhat static because of its origins as oratorio. And obviously as a stage director, I've worked very hard to make sure that that is not present because it can be very theatrical and melodramatic. But it is built into, you know, we don't sing many fugues in opera. And, you know, so, but certainly that's the language of so you have to kind of work with some of that. But, but uh, the other thing was the resistance, not strictly censored, but of putting religious subjects on the stage in France. When this piece premiered in 1877, it was in Weimar under the direction of Franz Liszt, and it was sung in German. And it took 13 years before it made it to the Paris Opera. People were uncomfortable with putting biblical subjects on the stage, and I'm sure it's because they probably felt that that kind of theatrical treatment diminished the significance of the theological purity of these characters, to see them on a human scale. So there was great resistance to biblical subjects, but when the piece finally made it to the Paris Opera, then it became kind of a fixture and enjoyed was made its American premiere right here in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And then the first performance that was in a concert performance in Carnegie Hall and then a year later in New Orleans in a stage production. But not surprisingly, given the strength of uh, the influence of Creole culture and French emphasis on the French language. But a colorful piece with a colorful history. Yeah, that's good. Please ask yeah. these artists any questions that you might have. No, it was a good presentation. Yeah, some good particular. Yeah. But I see, about, talking about the Samson, I see him more as sort of the victim. He was trapped. He was in the wrong. He, there was this 
A victim of bad choices. Well, we all like that. <laughs> of course, of course. But I keep wondering, maybe he thought that he could turn her around and, you know, save her. Or so. I, I'm reading more into this than this. No, actually, is. I think he, 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 at the beginning of the scene, when he decide when yeah. she starts to woo him at the beginning of that big love duet, I feel like there is a moment where he's saying, uh, Yes, and we, we can build this together. We can build this together. And then she's, she basically says, what, what do I care of your God? Well, and even more when yeah. he says, I've been anointed by God now to lead my people to mm -hmm. victory. And she says, what do I care about an Israeli victory? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. when she realizes exactly what the cost to her will be. Yeah. So, I mean, she's just very dismissive of that. Mm -hmm. So he tries. So you he, well, he tries, I think, to do the right thing, and in, in within his context of saying maybe she would join him. And I mean, if they married, or, or because he was married, according to the Bible, to a Philistine woman. But uh, the, you know, maybe Delilah converts to Jehovah, and we have a different opera. But he tried. Yeah. Okay, the ladies have prepared some lovely samplings of thematic food. Oh, wow. So food. That they, they went through, evidently, there is a, a book of biblical recipes somewhere that they found. So they went through the Jerusalem cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them use locusts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Anna.